the other day, uh, I was I was asked by somebody of what was kind of my uh, the moment uh, that I knew you know that I was saved, kind of that aha moment when everything changed. As it had to do with my faith, and I, some of you heard this before. Too bad you're gonna hear it again. Uh, the aha moment for me was probably it was about 24 years ago, and I was at a I went to a revival in Yukon uh, at Christ Church of Yukon, and there was a guy by the name of Dr. Grady McMurtry. He was there, and and the theme of the of the revival was creation, and and I don't I don't remember you know which day of it it was. I just remember that over the course of that. I became so, I, so totally convicted of the fact that I had been raised, you know, in Sunday school and, and with Genesis 1-1 and in the, you know, that uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And, and then I'd gone to school and, and I had learned about Lucy and, you know, the, the theory of evolution and you know, worms to dinosaurs to monkeys to people, and you know, the earth is 4.5 billion years old and, and all of that. And even though I didn't say it, I guess I just kind of thought that somehow, I guess they kind of, you know, they kind of work, okay? Uh, and I, the point is that in that moment, I was sitting there, and I, I was, I became so totally convicted that the fact is, the two are mutually exclusive, okay? One, they cannot both be true. One is true and the other is false. And, and I remember going home and in that moment, I was so convicted, I had to know which was the truth. And, and so I began studying and, and digging in. And like I said, it's honestly, it, it's what led to me being here today, okay? Uh, you know, my kind of, I guess my story, I was baptized when I was nine years old. Uh, when I was baptized, I was, I was on fire for the Lord. But somewhere between nine and about 30, I, something happened. And, and not that I quit believing, but I found myself to where I kind of stayed away from difficult conversations. Okay, and this is where I really I think we kind of come to of what we're going to be talking about today. If somebody started talking about like geology or the age of the earth, or that the Bible's full of contradictions, or that it's full of mistakes, or it's not really true, or archaeology said, I would find a way out of the conversation. I, I didn't want to get involved in that conversation, because I think that somewhere in the back of my mind, there was this fear, what if I find out that on that day in 1974, when I gave my life to Jesus, that it was all a lie? And so I was afraid to have those conversations. And, and the reason I, I kind of bring that up today is because I think a lot of us, we find ourselves, maybe not, you know, of, of that situation, but we have a problem with this idea of go fish because we have questions. What if they ask me a question I don't know the answer to? What if they won't listen to me? What if they reject me? What if I lose my job or I lose this relationship or, or I don't get to be a part of that club or that group or that whatever, what, what's going to happen then? And I would say this, I would love to tell you that none of that is going to happen, but I'd be lying to you because it might happen. It might. But my question is, should those be the things that we are focused on? Or there, should there be something else that we are more concerned about? If you want to turn to Acts chapter 4, that's where we're going to be. Acts chapter 4 is actually, uh, the, what we're going to be looking at today is the conclusion of, uh, of the account that we looked at last week. Okay? And so... If you guys remember, you know, in Acts chapter 4, what we were looking at last week was that, you know, Peter and John are headed into the temple. They see this guy who's begging uh, for money. They, they don't give him any money. But instead, what they do is they tell him, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And, and so he begins walking, and this caused a huge uproar, and Jesus is getting the credit. 
So needless to say, the religious leaders are going to have none of this. Well, that ends up, you know, Peter and John get arrested. They are thrown in jail like a couple of times. Uh, And then they get called before the religious council. And the religious council, you know, threatens them and then says that you are never, ever, 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 never, ever, never, ever, never, 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 ever to preach or teach in the name of this Jesus ever again. Okay, and, and so what we know is then that, you know, Peter and John, when, when they get the ultimatum and they say, okay, uh, here's what we know. The, the same Jesus that we're talking about is the one that you guys crucified, but God raised him from the dead, which proves that he truly is the Messiah that he said he is. And so when it comes to deciding who, you know, we're going to talk about and who we're going to listen to, whether we should talk about Jesus or not, we're going to side with God because he said, yes, we should. And so at that point, what we know is, you know, the, the religious leaders, they're like, okay, what are we going to do? We can't deny the miracle. Everybody's giving God the credit. And, you know, we, so they threatened him a little bit more and then they sent him home. And I think when they did, their hope was, you know, one or two things was going to happen is that, you know, maybe they'd get to catch it. Maybe their threats would work. I mean, maybe Peter and John would go home and go, whoo, that was, oh, yeah. And they would never speak again. That'd be, a, that'd be a win. Or they'd be able to catch them later and, you know, throw them in jail again. And this time they'd be able to get rid of them. Okay. And so that's where we pick up. And we're in Acts chapter 4. And it begins in verse 23. And what we read in Acts 4, 23, it says, On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people. Okay, now, we don't really know what the conversation was here, you know, that, that happened as they were headed back to headquarters. I, I am imagining if I had been part of that conversation, here's what it would have sounded like to me. Whew, that was a close one. Man, I can't believe that we just got out of there. I am... Whew, I'll tell you what, I think if we were looking for a sign, this is a sign that, that we need to move our base of operations out of Jerusalem. I don't think it's safe for us to be here anymore. I think we need to go and find a place that is more receptive to the message that we've got. I mean, I'm like, whew, I am so glad that we got out of that. But I think God's telling us that, you know, we probably need to from now on, I think we need to lay a little low, be subtle. You know, we need to kind of take it easy here, not be so out there. You work in the background a little bit more. That's probably what it would sound like if it was me. You get anybody else? Okay. Well, what we know is that Peter and John then went back to their own people and they reported everything that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Now, I want you to imagine for just a minute, if you, if you think about this scene, uh, <coughs> excuse me, pardon me, here. when Peter and John are standing before this, this group of religious leaders, this is two months after the crucifixion of Jesus. The same men that they are standing before, many of whom were the ones that had sentenced Jesus to to die, okay, to be crucified. They had sent him to Pilate. And and so you think about this. Here's Peter and John standing before them, and and it reads great, you know, in the scriptures when they're like, no, we're going to listen to God. You want to talk about mortal danger. If, if these men were willing to lie and to make up stories so that they could execute, publicly execute, a, a wildly popular religious personality, I mean a person, if they were willing to do that, why do you think that they wouldn't do the same thing to get rid of Peter and John or any of the other believers? I mean, I, it wouldn't be beyond them at all to do that. And so I think that when, I, was, I think when Peter and John got arrested, they pretty much assumed they were dead. And if they weren't dead, they were probably going to spend the rest of their lives in jail, okay, one way or the other. And so, you know, we talk about mortal danger and what is this? <laughs> they were in it, okay? They knew exactly what this was. And so we know that they went back 
uh, to their group. They went back to their people and, and they tell them everything that had happened. And now who was the group they were talking to? Obviously, apostles. I think it was other apostles. I think it was probably some of the followers who had followed Jesus during his three-and-a-half-year ministry. I think there's a good chunk of the group they're talking to, which are some of these 5,000 that, you know, have just come to believe Jesus in the last few days, okay, or in the last few weeks. And so you got everything from, from veterans to rookies and, you know, everywhere in between. And then verse 24, it says, when they heard this, in other words, when they heard what had been reported, they raised their voices together in prayer. And I want you to pay attention to their prayer because uh, it doesn't necessarily sound like one of ours. I mean, I can't, I, here's what it sounds like to us. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And that's how we start them all, right? Okay. So, and then we jump immediately to what we need and what we're looking for and what we're, you know, what we're wanting some, some help from and, you know, protect us from this and watch over us in that and, and bless us on this. And then, oh, 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 by the way, thank you so much for getting Peter and John out of that mess. But Lord, please place a hedge of protection around them so that just doesn't happen again. Amen. Isn't that how... It's not their prayer. Their prayer begins verse in 24 there. Sovereign Lord. Okay, in other words, and I... <laughs> he who is large and in charge. Okay? I mean, this, you know, sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth and everything that is within it. The one who created everything, who does as he pleases, when he pleases, the way he pleases, that sovereign Lord. I mean, I, I'm sorry, that, I just kind of get, whoa, when I start to think of that. And they continue, well, they say, see, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. And I'm thinking there's some meat on that bone. There, there's, some, there's some context there, okay? You know, this, is, I, this to me is the kind of prayer where you do, you're just kind of like, whoa. You start thinking about whose presence you are in. Who is it that we are talking to? I, this, that is the start of a prayer that is worshipful. That is the start of a prayer that understands who we're talking to. That is not, I'm sorry, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. No, no, th that is a prayer that, that has got some, some meat. And I, and I think this is when, I, to me, I think this is when they start to kind of have this, I call it an aha moment because I really think something changes here. Uh, and they go directly from this uh, and they go into a, what would have been, it was recorded, we read it in Psalms, but it would have been recorded by David. And, and so they immediately go from this they've talked about and they roll into uh, this, this prophecy, okay? And so they say, you spoke by the holy servant through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And this, was a, this is a messianic prophecy. This was given by David and it was talking about what was going to happen, okay? And so, you know, they've said, They've started off this prayer, and then they run in here and say, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And this is them saying that, you know, David spoke about this ahead of time. You know, you, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through your prophet David that these things would happen. Okay, that Jesus, the one and only Son of God, that they would come against him. And then this is where I think this kind of the aha gets a little bit bigger. Because they go from what David wrote, and now they start to kind of mesh that up with the events that have happened over the last couple of months. Okay, and, and so here they are, and they say, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles... And the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will 
had decided beforehand should happen. And I, and I really do. I think at this moment that it really, uh, it starts to kind of dawn on them like never before because this passage of scripture that they had recited before at a song, it was near and dear to, to their heart. It was a prophecy that they had been looking forward to. And, you know, and I think that what they're sitting there and I, I kind of, not only was it a prophecy that they were looking forward to, but now they realize it happened. And not only did it happen, it happened in our lifetimes. And not only did it happen in our lifetimes, but we were in it. We were witnesses to it. And not only, I mean, we weren't passive witnesses. We were active participants in all of this. And like I said, I think this is when you know, they're, they're sitting here and they're having their prayer. And, and I think that it's, it's kind of this big aha moment that happens. And, and I really do. I think there's this, Kind of this overwhelming sense of, whoa, we were there. How did we miss it? How did we, how did we not know? I mean, he told us. He told us, but we weren't ready. We, we, weren't, we weren't listening. How did, how did we miss it? And then, and then I think that there was this, I think there was this pregnant pause. And they just stopped. Because I don't think that they knew what to pray or how to pray. And, and, and here's what I mean. They're sitting here and they're thinking about these past moments. And I think that what they realize, I really do... I think they came to the conclusion, you know what? We've been praying for the wrong things all of this time. When, when, they, when they arrested Jesus, we gathered together. And I, I mean, I don't know that they didn't gather together and they prayed that somehow he would be released, but that wasn't God's plan. When, when he was taken before the, the religious leaders, and I think that they were praying, get him out of there, but that wasn't God's plan. When he went before Pilate, they, I think they were praying, now the truth will come out and, and Pilate's going to overrule them and he's going to set him free. But that was not God's plan. When they hung him on the cross, I think as they, they stood there watching from afar on Mount Calvary and, and the crowds taunted Jesus and they were saying, if you are the Christ, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and save us too. And I think they did. may not have said it out loud, but in the back of the mind they're thinking, yeah, 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 do that. Boy, that'll blow their minds. That'll teach them a lesson. But that was not God's plan. And then when they took his bloody, beaten body off of the cross... And they wrapped it in clothes. And they put it in the tomb. They all went home and hid out and mourned. Because they had just lost their, their friend, their teacher, their rabbi, their Lord. But if they would have known God's plan, they would have been rejoicing. And, and that's what I'm saying. I think that there is this moment that, that, they, that they realize, you know, as, as they're sitting here, that it's like, okay, bless me, bless me, protect me, protect me, just doesn't work in the backdrop of everything that we have witnessed and everything that we've come to understand. I mean, guys, Pilate thought that he was in control. No, he was only doing what God had decided was going to happen. Herod thought when he was trying to kill Jesus that he was in charge of this thing. But God was just fulfilling prophecy. When the religious leaders had Jesus crucified, they thought that they had gotten rid of the threat to their power base. What they figured out is that all they were doing was fulfilling prophecies that God had laid out thousands of years before. On Friday, when they laid Jesus in the tomb, Satan thought he'd won and come to find out he was just fulfilling God's plan. I don't think they knew how to pray. I really don't. 
I think they're in this moment, they're like, we don't know what to say. Because bless me, bless me, protect me, protect me, doesn't work. Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats. And I, basically what they're saying is, Lord, we're putting this in your hands. Okay, you've, you've, you've heard their threats. You, you know the, the anger and the hatred and the hostility that has been named at us, and we're just asking you, you know, consider that. Okay, uh, Lord, consider what's coming against your followers right now, and, and we just ask that, that you would consider that, and, and if you want to protect us from it, then you can protect us from it. If you want to bless us, then you can bless us. But, but here's what we ask is that just consider their threats. We just ask that you would enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Lord, if you choose to bless us, then bless us. But if not, enable us to speak your word with boldness. Lord, if you protect us from them, then protect us from them. But if not, enable us to speak your word with great boldness. You know, we look at this and, and I... Guys, I wish that that could become our prayer. I, I, oh, how I pray that we would catch that vision individually and as a church. Because I think too many times our prayers run completely opposite of what God's plan is. And I, now I'm not saying I'm not saying there's anything wrong with with praying for God's protection for His for his healing, for his... I'm not saying any of that, but the fact is that Jesus never said, come follow me and I will make you, keep you safe, make you popular, healthy, and wealthy. He said, come, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come and follow me and I will turn you into someone who brings other people to me. And I, and I know for some people, and maybe even for some of you, you know, we, we sit here and we talk about sovereign Lord, about God being large and in charge, being in control. You know, the fact that he is the creator of all things and therefore he can do as he pleases, when he pleases, how he pleases. And, and we kind of get this attitude that, you know what, if that's the case, then it really doesn't matter what I do or what I don't do because God's going to do what he's going to do, right? And, and I will say this, if, if the all-powerful all-knowing, in all places, nature of God demotivates you from telling people about Jesus, you missed the point. And, and I would challenge you to go back, read your Bible. Spend some time in your Bible because what you're gonna what you're gonna find is that you are gonna find a God who out of all of humanity decided to carve a chosen people for himself. He, he took one man, Abraham, and he used Abraham to fulfill a promise that he made to Adam and Eve in the garden. He, he took Abraham and through, I mean, through doubt, through famine, through, through slavery, through persecution, he carved out of all of humanity a people just for himself, a chosen people, so that out of those chosen people, he could send one man, his Son, his one and only son, so that he could die on the cross as the only perfect and atoning sacrifice for all of mankind. See, when, when we talk about sovereign Lord, see, that's all oh, sovereign Lord, because he has been doing what he planned and what he purposes from the very beginning. And, and here's the key to it, guys. Here, here's the kicker. He's invited us to be a part of it. He has invited us not to sit back and watch. He has called us to be a part of the team. Not like I said, not to sit on the bench 
Not, not to ride the bench and cheer on everybody else, but to be active participants in, in his unfolding drama of redemption and plan of salvation. Amen. And, and knowing that, knowing that he is sovereign Lord, knowing that he has a plan and he has a purpose for all of us, why would we sit idly by and leave it to somebody else? Why would we do that? And I know it, it's scary. I, here, here's a question for you. If, if when you, if you've ever sat and listened to somebody give their testimony and it brings a tear to your eyes, it, if, if when you watch somebody being baptized, if it just, I mean, wells up a, a song uh, in your spirit, if, if listening to somebody, you know, give their testimony just makes your heart beat a little bit faster, okay? Then why wouldn't we want to be a part of that? Why wouldn't we want to join in that? You know, I, I, and I know it's, it's scary sometimes, okay? Because we sit here and we're like, well, what if they, what if they reject me? Or, or what if they, you know, what if they say they, they won't listen to me anymore? And, and what if they turn their back on me? What if I don't want all the answers? What if I, what if I can't, you know, answer? Uh, uh, here's the deal, okay? Here, here's where sovereign God comes into this. It is understanding that that is their deal. That is, that is them. It's between them and God. It is not you. What, what Jesus has called us to do as fishermen is to fish. Plain and simple, okay? And, and so here, here's actually, I want to I ask you to do something this week because, and I, I hope that it goes longer than a week, but, but I pray that this would, would start here this week, that you would join me in this. And that is that this week, whenever you pray, whatever it's about, okay? I, I don't care. Doesn't matter what it's about, whether it is, you can be praying for your kids, you can be praying for your meal, you can be praying for safe trip, you can be whatever. Okay, when you're done, would you add this? Not, not the exact words, but the sentiment. The sovereign Lord, even if you don't, even if now is not the time, even if you choose not to, would you enable me, your servant, to speak your word with boldness? God, no matter what you have in store for me today, would you enable me, your servant, to speak your word with boldness? Even if you choose not to, I want to. Even if you say that it's not time to, I want you to give me the courage, and the conviction, and the desire to speak your word, to proclaim your name with boldness. And I know it's scary. It's scary to say that prayer. There's some of you who are like, oh, that sounds good. I'm not doing that. But I'll tell you what's going to happen. If you do, if you will pray that prayer, if you will add that into every prayer that you have, you will find that there will be more opportunities for you to witness over the course of this week than you've probably ever experienced in your life. You will find God putting people into your path. And, and that's the first thing that's going to happen. The second thing that's going to happen is honestly, you're going to discover what it feels like and what it means to be a part of his plan of salvation in the life of somebody else. And you're going to be overwhelmed by the fact that he's invited us to be a part of it. Like I said, they may not listen to you. They may, they may reject you. They may not talk to you anymore. They may, you know, kick you out of the club. But that's God's deal. See, and this is where us understanding sovereign Lord is to say, God, you have called me to fish. You told me to follow you. And then become someone who would point other people to you. And that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell them about you. I'm going to point the way to you. What they do with it is up to them. But I'm going to hold up my end of the deal. So enable me to speak your word with great boldness. I'm going to ask you to stand.
We're going to have our time of decision. And guys, I, I know this is, this is one of the toughest things because we're afraid. What if they call me a Jesus freak? What if they, you know, what if they don't? <laughs> Are those the things we ought to be worried about or should we be more worried about the one who died on a cross for us that said, listen, this is what I'm asking of you. I just, the inheritance that Mike talked about. I am going to take care of everything, he says. Everything that, it, that matters to you is handled. The bills that you cannot pay, I am paying. The debts that you owe, I am wiping clear. I am create, I'm giving you a new name. I'm giving you a new life. I'm giving you a new purpose. And I am giving you a new future. And all I ask is that as you follow me, you point people to me as well. Why would we not? Why would we not? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, you are so good to us. And, and it's so, it, it sometimes, God, it scares us to death to open our mouth. It, it scares us sometimes to, to speak out about your name because we wonder what's going to happen and, and how people are going to respond to us. And God, I do. I just pray that you would give us the courage and the conviction to understand that their opinion of us does not matter, but yours does. And that's what we are seeking after. We are seeking to make you smile. We are seeking to bring glory and honor to you, the one who died for us because you love us that much. God, I pray that you would give us courage that you would give us this conviction, that you would give us the drive and the desire in whatever way, little or big, to speak your word with great boldness. It's in Jesus' name we ask this. Amen.